I'm Mike, a co-founder and CEO of Blair, and we finance college education through income share agreements. And how that works is that students can sign up on our website, apply for funding, and then if we accept them, we wire them the money within a day, and they agree to pay us a percentage of their income once they're graduating. And maybe some context on uh, the team first, and maybe sticking to what's relevant for what we're doing right now. Uh, all of us are from Germany, and at our schools back at home, 40% of students are using income share agreements to finance their tuition. So we are very familiar with income share agreements from a user's perspective, but we've also dove very deep in terms of how they work in more detail. So during college, we did a lot of finance research, started doing out a lot of P2P learning research, then dove into alternative credit methods and trying to uh, price alternative assets in general, and then spent one and a half years on predicting incomes and modeling income uh, income share agreement-based funds for different countries, the UK, Germany, France, and also Canada and the US. And we basically use this underwriting model that we've developed back in the day now to commercialize it and help students in the US. And because we think that the student debt crisis here is fairly screwed and that income share agreements can help a lot of students. And then I also spent uh, some time at Stripe where I learned things about payments, uh, which is helpful if you're building uh, a company that moves a lot of money around. And uh, maybe some very brief refresher on some of the terms. I think most of you are probably familiar with income share agreements, um, so I keep it very like, short. The income share rate basically describes the percentage of income someone owes after he or she is finished. Uh, there can be a coding school, like Lambda school or something else, but they can also be college. And it's just like, for example, 5%. It's usually a gross income. And then you have the payment period or the duration. This is the amount of years or months you have to repay if you uh, want to comply with a given ISA, and then you have something that's uh, called the repayment cap. Usually you do repayment caps, there are a lot of cool things you could do without them, but most regulators don't really like that. So the rep repayment cap basically describes the maximum amount uh, you would have to repay, so that's usually like 2x, 2.5x of the original funding amount. And then lastly you have something that's called a salary floor, and the salary floor describes the amount of money you have to earn in order to pay for this given year. So if you earn, for example, below 35K under a given ISA, um, then you don't have to repay, and the year just gets deferred up to a maximum of, in our case, four to five years. And we think that ISAs will change consumer finance. And I like to use the analogy of venture, uh, venture financing. Um, if you would like to build a startup right now, let's assume some of you would, and you would still have to go to a bank and get a loan, as you would have like maybe 50 years ago, then 99% of the startups in San Francisco wouldn't exist. And venture financing or equity financing just enables a lot of different ways. And we find it fairly stupid that consumers only have debt as an option. There are different kinds of debt. There are a lot of different kinds of repaying debt. But in principle, you only have debt. And we think there's a lot of different ways consumers could approach personal finance if they have different options. And we think ISAs for education is the first step to getting there, and we think there are a lot of other really cool financial products that will come uh, over the next couple of uh, years and decades. A couple were in our YC batch, uh, we think that we are one of them. And yeah, so why would anyone invest in income share agreements? Because how we think about it is, we don't do peer-to-peer, -peer. that like, has been tried before to some degree, but we want to, we want to establish income share agreements as an institutional asset class. And if you talk to institutional investors, they care about two main things, which is firstly, risk-adjusted returns. And since the interest environment in the US uh, in terms of student loans is, like, like I said before, it's fairly screwed. You have to pay a lot of interest on your student loans if it's not federally subsidized. So uh, the, the risk-adjusted returns are fairly good if you know how to price them. Then secondly, what's one of the best things about income share agreement based assets is that they usually don't really correlate a lot with other asset classes. So it's a really good portfolio diversification method, which institution investors really like, and also some high net worth individuals really like. And the last thing, which is what we are very excited about, and some investors are as well and others are not at all, is the social impact of what you're doing, because you technically enable students to study with a peace of mind and you enable students to protect their own downsides, which is what we personally are most interested in. And this is why we started the company, because 
when we, like the last company we built was focused on helping students earn money during college. And we helped a couple of thousand students, mostly in Europe, to earn a couple of million bucks uh, in seven months. And then the, the next thing we noticed is like the ceiling was fairly low for what we're doing. So we looked for the next thing. And we talked to our friends in the US and asked them, what's your biggest worry right now? What's your biggest problem? And student debt came over and over and over again. And we talked to our friends in Germany, the ones who study at private schools that are also expensive. None of them really worried because most of them were using income share agreements. So we thought, why don't we bring this to the US and use what we know can really help a lot of people and make it mainstream here. And a little more about our product and how it works in like on a very high level. So you sign up on our website, you give us a lot of data points. There are some data points that we like actively gather, which is the school, uh, the major, on the next slide I have a couple of others. But then we also look at a couple of behavioral data points. So how we do, how we do that is we look at whether or not people have actually read through um, the explanations of everything. We, we see how long someone takes to read through disclaimers, whether or not they read it at all, and a couple of other things. Then we use the underwriting model where we basically predict the income of someone. We can do that for like roughly 50 majors. Um, the first two funds were focused on California. We will launch a couple of other states soon. And once we have their income, and what's super important is the variance of the income, because you, we are not a VC fund. We don't want to fund 99 people that are unemployed and one Bill Gates, which would be amazing for Sequoia, but which would be really bad for us because our repayments are capped. So we need to be right, not only on average, but we need to be like within a given distance for every single one. And so we, we really like things that are predictable and not predictable in the sense that everyone will do the same thing, but they're just made some majors that are better than others. For example, there are some majors where one person goes to Wall Street and earns 200K immediately, and the other 99% struggle a bit in terms of getting a job. And then, uh, for example, one of the best majors for ISA is actually nursing, because it's very predictable what they're going to do. They're becoming nurses. Uh, two other factors, they're usually or often from underprivileged backgrounds, which we really like because we like helping those people, but which is also good in the business sense because they need money. And often they don't have credit scores, which brings me to the last point. Um, we always underwrite based on future potential and not on credit scores or cosigners. And we can do that because we are basically aligned with their incentives, right? If they earn more, we earn more, which means that we can finance people that traditional lenders can't finance. Because traditional lenders look at your credit score. A lot of people don't have credit scores, specifically students. Where would you like have that from if you don't I think how it works in the US is like most people like from privileged backgrounds get a credit card from their parents fairly early on, start spending on it. But if you don't have that, which is a lot of students who don't, you don't, you can't really access credit if you don't have a co-signer like someone in your family who can sign the, uh, the contract for you. And for us, we don't care. You can be like as broke as you want if you have the right skills. And if we think you have the right ambition and the right potential, we will fund you. And we actually do not only give them money, we also help them to be more employable and to get into their first job. And then we support them while they are under our ISA. So if they're ever unemployed, we help them to get a new job. And we do that for two main reasons. Firstly, because we think it's a better holistic product for the student and further protects their downside. But also it's a good deal for the investors as well, right? Because 80% of the people that default on their student loans default because they're unemployed. And if we cut the downside risk of being unemployed by helping them to get the new job, then we significantly cut the risk of our asset, which is pretty cool. Uh, maybe one last thing um, about uh, one common misconception about ISAs is that it only works for very high earners. And that's not the case. I hinted at it before. It's about predictability, not necessarily about the amount. So we can fund someone that has a predictable like 30K income afterwards, maybe not in San Francisco because then they don't have any money left, but like in other places in the country. And we also give every single one an individual rate. So someone who has higher earning potential, let's just use the simple Bay Area example of a CS major at Stanford, gets a lower income share rate because he will have more income and he's less risky or she. And then someone else who studies 
maybe in the same year at Stanford, but has less internships or just other potential like variables that are a little worse for us, they will get a slightly worse rate. So we actually prevent adverse selection by incentivizing good people to apply. And yeah, we think that this aligns uh, incentives really well. I try to keep it high level, but if you want to nerd out about income share agreements, alternative asset-based um, lending in general, or j if you just like helping students and young people, which I'm really passionate about, then uh, come talk to me afterwards.